Hello. Hi. I'm Brother Dan. I'm Sister Lisa. And this is another episode of our podcast called Siblings in Zion. And this episode is going to conclude this series that we began, the start of this season, in which Sister Lisa here has been reading from her journals, letters, other correspondence, as she grew up as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, went to an LDS school, BYU-Idaho, decided to serve a mission for the church in Florida, and ultimately decided to end her membership just some three years ago. Just some. Some three years Some three. Back. Previous. And uh, so the last few have been about her mission. This will also be, and it's going to be a little bit different, a little bit unique, I think. So why don't you tell us what uh, we're going to be hearing from? I hope. Today. Well, the idea for this episode is that I will be sharing some of the correspondence that I had while I was on my mission with my so-called mission president. So-called. So-called. For every mission, there is one man and his wife appointed Very important. to lead and organize the missionaries of that mission. I had one mission president the entire time. Some people, some people have two, depending on when the cycle starts and stops, but a mission president serves for three years. So I had this man my whole 18 months. And during that time, you're required to send one email a week to him, updating him on how you're doing, how your companion is doing, how your work is going. So this is a collection that, a collection of emails that they actually printed out for me, the mission office, and gave to me when I completed my mission. And to remind their audience, this is the Florida Jacksonville mission. Yes. That he would be presiding over. Yes. And most of his missionaries would be men, a sprinkling of young women. Right. Such as yourself. It seems like there were several of us Mm -hmm. sisters at the time, kind of that swell of missionaries. Post age change. Yes. This is 2014. Yeah. I finished my mission in 2015. Mm -hmm. So do you have any questions or concerns? (laughs) I'm very concerned. Questions? As to what this means. Things things you hope I'm going to talk about? Uh, No. I'm curious though. I've never seen or heard any of this. That's true. This will be a surprise. I read through and highlighted sections of emails to share. Just snippets. I'm not going to read the whole thing. No. But no, just no, no, no. things that stuck out to me that I thought were important to say to him. And how my tone changed throughout my mission. Okay. And some of the feedback that he gave me. Or encouragement, tips, whatever. I do want to say, just in case anyone I served with or even my mission president happened to see this, which the odds are slim, but my intent for this episode is not to ridicule or degrade or insult anything about what my mission president did or like any aspect of his service, if that makes sense. I felt at the time that he did the very best he could. And from stories that I've heard from other missionaries and about other missions and the way that mission presidents have conducted leadership or whatever, it could have been so much worse. Okay. You know, like at least this guy, you could tell, really cared about us and tried to show that in the best way that he knew how. And he did make it feel like, again, for the context of a mission, he made it feel safe and it, he made it feel organized and not we were just running around without any direction or guidance. Mm-hmm. Or like we knew that he was aware of us and that he was checking in on us regularly. So, again, I just want to say for the situation, I think he did the very best he could. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. Did you feel like his expectations of missionaries was appropriate or daunting or? 
I mean, yeah, he did have really high expectations. You know, maybe it's just my perception, but it did seem like he really cared about numbers. But obviously that reflects on his reputation. So that, I mean, that's kind of his job. And here we return back to the very obvious corporate structure. Yeah. Of this church. Right. So again, the for the context. Yes. Again. He did fine. Sure. <laughs> this isn't like, I was abused or whatever. Like, that's not what this is. I just want to highlight what this relationship is like. If you have served a mission, you can relate. If you are going to serve a mission, this is maybe what to expect. Or just to compare your experience, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. After all of that, by the way, I also remember thinking that this was weird. That you had to do this? That I had to do this sure. at all. I would say you're right. Yeah. You're supposed to email him on preparation day, which it would be a Monday. Mm-hmm. But he told us that if you are going to send an email to him on Sunday night, that that would be okay. And he was the only person that you were allowed to email on Sunday night. Okay. Or that you could at least draft it out. And then send it the next morning. Just so that it didn't take up time for things you could be doing that you only have time to do on Monday morning. In the very first email to him, I say that my companion and I both got blessings from the bishop in the ward that we were serving in. As like um, when you're starting something new, it's my first area. So I told him, that I felt like that was important. Of course. And one of the things that Bishop said in that blessing was the way you attain that feeling of complete satisfaction when a mission is concluded is by attaining that satisfaction each and every day up until that point. So that was, in my mind, how I was going to be successful, is if every day I feel successful, then by the time I'm done, I will feel. Like, I did a good job. Does that make sense? I hear what you're saying. Yeah. (laughs) Does it seem reasonable? Not really. No. I also said, it doesn't matter about the numbers. So that was my attitude going into the mission was, it just doesn't matter. It's really about how I'm feeling about my progress and my commitment. Mm -hmm. But also numbers. But also numbers. Are good. We want them. (laughs) So my mission president responded by saying, The two of you are going to be a great companionship and am excited to see how your work grows and progresses through your efforts. I think a lot of the time he did voice to text to respond to things because he just had so fucking many to get through. (laughs) I mean, good God, every single week he has to respond to like upwards of 200 emails for each person Mm -hmm. and make them feel like, yeah, I hear you. I see you. I know who you are deeply. Yeah. (laughs) I am your surrogate father. Yeah. You know, the next one I told him about my experience giving out my first Book of Mormon or the first time I gave out a Book of Mormon to someone we met while knocking doors. And I said, we met a young man who's very liberal and into psychology. (laughs) And I, (laughs) very liberal. And I said, how do you know that Jesus Christ is the one for you? That was my opening question. (laughs) The one for you? (laughs) What? (laughs) Um, And then part of my testimony was the fact that we have literally been able to feel that cleansing in our souls. And that's proof that Jesus is the son of God. Um, This kid also worried that he would confuse the Holy Ghost with a schizophrenic episode and that it could just be a chemical thing. And I said that that reminded me of Korhor having a frenzied mind. Mm Mm-hmm. So I got out of Book of Mormon and inside I prayed that I could find the passage that I was thinking of because because I couldn't remember exactly where that was. And when I opened it, it turned exactly to Alma chapter 30 about Korahor and my jaw dropped open and I was so excited and grateful. Like that seriously was such a testimony builder because it was like God answered my prayer right in front of me. It was as if. You, I mean, that's not a coincidence. No. Okay. No, no, no. Brother no. Dan. It's not like you actually did have that <laughs> book chapter in your brain. Like somewhere in the middle. A, a rough estimate of your 
spatial awareness yeah. of where but Alma is in the But to the exact page? Oh, I, mean, I mean, you could call that a small m miracle. It is remarkable. It is. So, that's what you I'm saying. You want to give a brief summary of what, of what that the means? core horror character is? Not really. Okay. You want me to? I think it's important to, for people. Even <laughs> a lot of the ex mormons might not even... I don't know that I remember well enough. He, he's like a, the prototypical atheist non-believer. Yeah. I get him confused with one of the other versions of that, like antichrist people. Yeah. But I think that Korahor went around saying, you know, God doesn't exist, like you're saying. And then I think he was really successful at t- taking people away from the gospel. And then in the end... Was he struck dumb or something? See, that's why I can't remember if it's if that also happens to him, because it happens to Alma the Younger. But I think it happens to Korhor. Something happens to him. He gets he his come He gets, he his come gets up and... like, trampled. <laughs> like, this is a weird story, but he, then he admits, I always knew it was true. Oh, boy. But the devil made me do it, essentially. Puke. Puke. Well, guess what? Maybe we might earmark that for an episode next season, huh? It is, a, it is kind of an interesting part of the Book of Mormon. It's super weird. Mm-hmm. But, huh? um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, I just feel embarrassed that I can't remember all of the exact oh, details. And you should. Why would I be, feel embarrassed about that? I should be elated <laughs> that... You know what? I don't remember. I can't recall. It's not important. Good God. <laughs> I'm like worried about people judging me that like, I don't yeah. know. Well, obviously enough. you never really believed. Right. Whatever. Okay. You never had a real testimony. <sighs> I didn't highlight a response from my mission president about that. I just thought I would include that story. Okay. In this email to him, I tell him about the first time I knocked doors and I said, I felt bad that at certain points this week, I was unsuccessful at being happy when things were hard. I knocked doors for the first time and we were only at it for maybe a half an hour, but I was D-O-N-E done. By knocking on doors, I am doing exactly what I am supposed to be doing and offering happiness to God's children in Gainesville. He said, the nicer you can be on the doorstep, the more likely they will be to listen to the next set of missionaries. Remember, there is no growth in the comfort zone. I don't really understand the logic of we knock on their door, we talk to them as missionaries, then they will be more excited. Even though they reject us, they'll be more excited to talk to the next set of missionaries. The next set of male missionaries. Right. <laughs> Sisters are just preparing the way for elders. We wow them with our good looks and our charm, and then the guys like lay down the doctrine because they know what they're talking about. That's right. That's right. right. Yeah, that's Priesthood. how that goes. Didn't realize... It's all becoming so clear. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next entry, I tell him about the first time I taught the restoration lesson, which is the first missionary discussion that you teach to an investigator. And I said, I was prepared to take the lead. And for some reason, as we sat down, I got so nervous. I felt so uncomfortable starting out. When you have a testimony of the Book of Mormon, every minute question of logic falls into place (laughs) and it doesn't even matter because in your heart you know it's true that sentence doesn't even make sense but i think i was just trying to say like when you have a testimony you don't need logic (laughs) exactly (laughs) once you once you already believe the logic or illogic you might find around it doesn't matter because you already believe you already have your testimony that's right and that comes first and you doubt your doubts. Then I told him that for the first time since I got here, we had an investigator at church. So I'm kind of like reporting to him in the first few weeks, like, look, aren't you proud of me? I did this for the first time. I did this important thing for the first time. Look, I'm doing what I was taught to do, Yeah, you know? And I said, miracles happen every day because God loves us. FJM for life. With like six exclamation points. FJM is Florida Jacksonville. <laughs> for life, dude. For life. <laughs> I love this so much. I want to do it for the rest of my oh, life. Puke. This is the first time leading the area on a trade off. So you trade companions with the leaders 
the sister missionary leaders. And I stayed in my area, which means I'm in charge for the day because I know where we are. I said to my mission president, it's amazing the switch that was flipped inside of me. Missionary work makes a lot more sense now that I'm forced to figure things out and rely on what I've learned about the area. And I have proven to myself that I can continue on and do things that I have never done before with complete confidence, even though I have a new companion by my side. So that was my first time not being with my trainer, being with another missionary and being like, oh, I can do this with anybody because I can do this. Yeah. And then I said, I can do it. I said, not even once will I not read the Book of Mormon every day. (laughs) Not even once. That was a big theme. His wife would give talks and remind us like, not even once will I do this. Hmm. Not even once. I will not fail. To indoctrinate myself. Yes. Every single day. Daily. Okay, this is going into a new transfer. And I say to him, I'm trying to figure out why life is so stressful all the time. I feel that separation between all I know I should do and be and what I I am in reality accomplishing. Why is it so stressful? Why Why is this so hard? Why am I having like a really bad time here? Hmm. And he said, keep working hard. Don't give up. I know that you won't. I know that you won't disappoint me, will you? And everyone. Just I know you won't do that. Keep doing right? it. Not like, oh, I hear you. This work is really hard. Sorry that you're struggling. Do you need to talk to someone? No, just keep going. Keep doing it. Don't give up. Dear President, I have been learning a lot about obedience. When we follow our own inclinations, we are weak and limited. But God is unlimited in his infinite knowledge and wisdom. So why not follow the rules? (laughs) I mean, it's pretty simple. Why not follow all the rules and guidelines set forth by other human (laughs) beings in the name of God? It's pretty simple arithmetic, if you ask me. Hmm. I mean. God said so. It's. Duh. You know? He said, I love your thoughts on obedience. Uh, I love that. I love that about you. I am grateful that you can be counted on to be a great example for this important principle. I love it. Love it. Love it. I told him, I took time this week to write long letters to both my dad and my brother. I tried my best to teach them and share all my love with them like you suggested. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, teach me. Mm Mm-hmm. During a mission president's kind of like cycle of responsibilities, One of the things they do is tour the mission and interview missionaries one-on-one. And so I remember being in a room with him, just the two of us, and telling him that I was worried about you and dad specifically. As far as like staying strong in the gospel or something. His advice to me was to just love them and teach them. Be a good example. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. I told him my theme for this week has been a quote from Uchtdorf, which is doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. Oh, here we go. Classic. Here we go. The next email I sent said, I sort of figured that I should be perfect by now. What? So I'm, I'm expressing to him, you know, I'm stressed. I feel like I need to be perfect. I feel like I'm falling short constantly. Like we've talked about in previous videos. Just trying to tell him, this is what my mental state is like. This is what I think about daily. And he said, dear sister, parentheses, almost perfect, my last name. Mm -hmm. You are almost like a Mary Poppins, practically perfect in every way type missionary already. What? I've always remembered that he called me Mary Poppins. (laughs) Or at least suggested that I was analogous. (laughs) And that made me feel really good at the time, but I was so, so hard on myself that I couldn't accept any compliment that he gave me. In my mind, he was saying that to make me feel like I could be that way, not that I actually was. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. My response to that was, President, you crack me up. Mary He's Poppins. Silly. In my dreams. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) 
I said, yesterday was amazing. We had the goal to talk to 70 people and I felt such a purpose and determination behind me all day. Like numbers. Yeah. We didn't reach 70, but it didn't even matter. We believe God's purposes were accomplished by setting that goal. But even though we aren't counting, we made it to 32. 32 what? People that we just talked to in one day that we like approached. That's plenty. In one day. Yeah. I also felt like I had to say love. Like Hmm. I felt like I had to sign off that way. You did? Yeah. Why? And I did almost every time. Because I felt like that was the expectation that you were supposed to love him. That you were supposed to feel like he is your dad for this year and a half. And that you can tell him anything. That you should tell him everything. That he is like... He is appointed by God to take care of you. And he has like a special ability to understand you. And they do talk about this a lot on your mission that, you know, by revelation, this mission president was selected for this mission at this time. And Mm -hmm. he was specifically called. Part of the way that they assign you to a mission is you needed that mission president is the thinking that that's part of the revelation is that you have a special connection with this person. It's all part of the plan. Exactly. Almost like a pre-existence, pre-mortal existence type of oh fate or destiny. Oh boy. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you get it. You get it. Skip, 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 blah, blah, blah. Words, words, words. Yeah, yeah, yada. Baptize, baptize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I tell him... Today in Target, there were so many people after Christmas shopping and scavengering for clearance, so I took the opportunity to give a few He is the Gift cards and found a really sweet girl who wants to come to church. It was great. I love finding in Target. I think I've shared that instance before, but I think that was my way of trying to come across to him like, I will talk to anyone in any situation. I am such a good missionary. Yeah. I talk to people in Target. Yeah. You know? And he said, talking with everyone gives you much greater likelihood of baptizing everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I like those odds. Get those numbers. You talk to everyone, you baptize everyone. Missionaries in my mission would be like, why do we brush our teeth to baptize? Ew. Yeah. No, you can kidding. Back to the military crap. Yeah, exactly. To baptize. <laughs> um, You know, I realize that Satan plays a really mean game when we try to talk to everyone. The more frightened I am, the nicer the person ends up being. It is ridiculous. Does that make sense? Like, the more anxious I feel to approach someone, the nicer they end up being when I do talk to them. Hmm. To him, I say, after Elder Neil L. Anderson visited our mission and talked to us. Special. A very special meeting. I say, I am ready for the miracles. After listening to Elder Anderson, I made a firm resolve to lift my faith, to not be afraid of setting baptismal goals, because if I don't set them, they won't happen, which isn't really what I'm ultimately afraid of. So why not try? After prayer and some surprising revelation, I have set my goal for 10 baptisms this year. I am clearly delusional and desperate at this point. Yeah, you wrote 10 question mark exclamation doesn't make any sense for the time or the area or for my previous track record. I told him that I'm marking references to the savior this time around in the book of Mormon. I love this study because I'm focusing on Christ and praying that as I make him the center of my study, he will become the center of my life. Hmm. Like while you're reading, you highlight everything that he did, everything that he said, references to him, all about Jesus. Yeah. So much Jesus. The person that they didn't even know because he wasn't alive yet, but they knew he would be called Jesus. Yeah. Christ. That's right. I say, I feel that the spirit has been preparing me for a training call, whispering in my ear that I should prepare more diligently to be the most obedient missionary I can be. (laughs) Getting ready to train just like up to the craziness in my brain. Oh. It's just like more paranoid and (laughs) more obsessive about being obedient. Yeah. Or at least projecting. Yeah. That you are. Yeah. My mission president said, isn't it interesting how the Lord whispers in our ears when things like becoming a trainer are happening? 
It's a classic example of listening to the first thought and then preparing accordingly. You will be wonderful as you are exactly obedient. She will be very blessed by you. Thanks for being such a great missionary. With much love, President. I tell him basically that if I think about what I would want to know if I were a mission president, then this is what I would want to know. And this is the email that I sent him. And I say, I was pondering about what an appropriate level of stress is for a missionary. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being you can't eat or sleep. You're so entrenched with worry. And one being you're laying in a hammock on the beach, figuratively speaking, I'd say I'm a solid five, rarely wavering from that. Some days are more awkward than others, but generally I feel confident and happy and loved. More importantly, I have so much love in my heart for those around me. So I'm trying to gauge what is normal. He said, tried really reading through some of those principles and the adjusting for missionary booklet. There's a booklet called Adjusting to Missionary Life that you get when you're a new missionary and it has tips for coping (laughs) when you don't have anything that you normally use to cope. So basically he's like, did, have you really read it though? Because clearly if you've read it and it's not working, then you didn't really understand. He said, I would much prefer that you be in a green zone with a one or two being your stress level than being in a medium of five. Life is too short and there's too much to enjoy out here. I would love to talk with you if I can help you in any way with any of this. I would love to take any burdens off of your shoulders if possible. Give me a call or let's arrange a time to get together. The difference between working hard and being urgent versus working hard and being urgent with stress. We just need to help you with the perspective so that you can get rid of the stress side of things. I could see it in your training and how well your trainee is doing. Yeah. Hmm. So he seems to think you should be able to do all of this and be fine. Yeah. Does that sound accurate? He does seem like he's concerned and that he'd like to do something about it. But sure. Yeah, like you, you should be able to manage this. Right. Keep it at a one or a two. It's not that hard. I don't yeah. want you to no. like freak out, you know. I don't want to have to date with you. And and then in zone meetings, he's like, not even once, you know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just felt like I got mixed messages sometimes, mm. you know. I said, well, well, I'm not really sure how I'm feeling about things. I really want to be a good missionary. I feel like a good person, but sometimes a bad missionary. The one baptism I've really seen took four months, and she had been investigating for nine months previously to my arrival. I know I'm not doing everything I can do, so I'll pray. I know this is where I'm supposed to be. I said, I literally felt spiritual growing pains as we participated in my first zone meeting and trade off all in the same day. So this is literally when I'm a sister training leader at this point. And he said, I hope you are keeping a good journal of experiences as you are going through these growing pains. They really are the best, especially when you can look back in hindsight at how much you really grew during those times. You will make it through as you find yourself on your knees and you really take the time to prepare for trade-offs and zone trainings. <laughs> yeah. Get on your knees. These really are the best times, though. Truly. Truly. And you'll realize that. Later, you'll look back and see that. So I was a sister training leader and one of the sisters I went on a trade-off with and then in my email... To the president, I say, I was able to go to this area for the first time. And then as a sister training leader, I gave him updates about the sisters that we were given, like, I was going to say dominion over. We were just assigned to watch over them. I said, we talked about being obedient and how it builds our faith. And I helped her set goals to accomplish that. And I noticed several things that need a bit of correction. So I'm reporting to him about what I think she needs to change. Timeliness, music, dignified language, et cetera. But I mostly tried to build her up and encourage her to have the faith to find and to have a golden hour every day. I'm like a little spy. Yeah. And you're supposed to be. I didn't notice here you said, happy early Father's Day. You're the greatest missionary dad there ever was. Yeah. Total suck up. Blah. Barf. He said to me, I appreciate the great advice that you are giving to those you are doing trade-offs with. I think it's important for you to have follow-up conversations when it comes to those obedience issues like you are noticing. 
we need to be able to rely on you as our leaders to encourage and to make sure that they are gaining their own testimony of the importance of all the things that you were talking about with her. I think you are doing fantastic. So he wants us to notice and to fix it. (laughs) (laughs) We need all of you to be robots. Good job. Fix it. Yeah. (laughs) I told him that with the companion that I'm a sister training leader with, we read through the missionary white handbook and adjusting to missionary life booklet and came up with a plan to once and for all root out the desire to have romantic thoughts. (laughs) Oh, I said, I've been struggling with this for a while. And now that I'm in a YSA ward, young single adults, now more than ever is the time to be incredibly careful. I've wanted to be a completely obedient, consecrated by the book missionary for a long time. We both feel, me and my companion, like the circumstances are right. And most importantly, the desire is really there to make this a reality. We are becoming I will missionaries. We just want to work like dogs, give it all we have. We want to be purified. Wow. We are becoming straight up nuns. (laughs) We are like, I don't even want to think about it. God, please remove any thoughts of sexuality or desire for human connection because it's distracting me from doing your work, you know? Wow. All he said was keep working to find the elect. They are out there, especially with the YSA. We love all you are doing. Love, President. Great job. Great job. Love it. Keep it up. The elect. Yeah. I said the goal with OYMs seemed to be going well. All of the sisters improved dramatically and seemed to be really excited about it. OIMs stand for open your mouth. So it's the number of times that you talk to someone in a day. Like I said, like, oh, we had seven, we were aiming for 70 OIMs, but we only got 32. Wow. Yeah. Complaining about how stressful this is, how perfect everyone else is. I'm not living up to this. He's okay. So he says in response to me berating myself, For some reason, sisters just like to compare themselves to everyone else but themselves. If you could stop long enough to see your own divine potential, like we talked about today in our missionary leadership council meeting, you'd be in awe of yourself. You are an amazing woman and sister training leader missionary. You need to quit comparing yourself to your companion. I would like to have a better understanding of what you feel that you are not obedient about. Maybe there's something I can do to help you. So maybe you ought to give me a call when you have a private moment so I can help you. Tell me more. In my own opinion, I think you are a marvelous missionary and I am very grateful for you. You have such a bright and hopeful attitude and a wonderful way of loving and serving, not just with the sisters, but with everyone around you. One thing that will be very important is to get rid of criticism about yourself and about others. Make sure that you are able to not allow Satan to breathe in the oxygen around you and his influences of negativity, sarcasm, and criticism. (laughs) Breathe in the oxygen around you. Don't give Satan any oxygen is what he would say. Yeah, because he needs oxygen. Uh Uh-huh. Give me a call when you have a minute. Thank you for being an awesome missionary. We love you. Any thoughts? How often would you call him? I almost never did. Any time that he suggested, oh, give me a call when you have a second or, you know, we should talk. I just felt like such a burden. I didn't want to take time out of his busy schedule because, like, for him to just stop and only talk to me seemed unnecessary and a waste of his time. And I think I also felt like, what could you possibly say to make this better? And I was embarrassed that I was stressed because I should be fine. I should be doing this and be so happy because this is the most important thing I could be doing, you know? Yeah, but it seems like a very like temporary advice to stop being so critical. Yeah. Because of course you're supposed to be critical of yourself if you're not. Right meeting standards and yeah exactly we have all of these rules but don't criticize yourself give yourself a break but be exactly i mean you're not doing that bad so i'm not gonna right you're not staying out past curfew you know in the triage of missionary rule breakage you are mary poppins yeah you know you're fine (laughs) almost almost oh god okay here's this is great i say I really appreciated Missionary Leadership Council and felt like I was given the instruction that I needed to understand my purpose as a sister training leader. And so I will continue to study those materials and continue to do my best. I ended up asking our zone leaders for a blessing. It was definitely comforting and full of counsel. 
you would think that after almost two transfers, I would have gotten the hang of it by now. He said, how about you create that quarter jar and you take me and my wife out for ice cream as you are working on the sarcasm and criticism and negativity? Hopefully there won't be enough quarters to do that, but maybe if you can really overcome that so you can see the real blessings of being positive, we will take you out for ice cream, okay? Are you game? Okay. Two weeks with no negative comments or thoughts. Let me know. Love you. Ice cream bribery? (laughs) I'm sorry? Interesting. 24-7 positivity. No negativity. Was he doing that? Doubtful. Keep it peppy. Keep it peppy. Keep it light. Show business, baby. <laughs> um, okay, so in addition to sending him a letter, he also sent us a weekly mission-wide email. Mm-hmm. So he would respond to us individually, but he, he would also write the whole mission a letter and... Part of this one says, elders and sisters, what are you willing to put on the altar of sacrifice so you can become more fully converted, so you can be changed like the senior apostle Peter? The driving force behind Peter's conversions started with his love of the Savior. Once we feel that, we will be driven to give our all. We will be able to do as Peter did, to symbolically give up our 153 fish to do his will. We are a mission that expects mighty miracles. We must be a mission full of missionaries who are fully converted to our Savior, Jesus Christ, out of our love for him. I would invite you to find two things this week that you have personally, that you can lay on the altar of sacrifice so that you too can become more fully converted. We love you and pray mightily for you every day. What would you have to sacrifice? Anything that counts as being disobedient. Sexual thoughts, being late, not praying. Any rule that you're breaking, if you can up the ante on your But this your was to everyone, not just to you. Yes. Okay. This is to the whole mission. Mm-hmm. And especially you, and you know who you are. That's right. Oh, okay. No, I do want to read this. Okay. So he says in a letter to the whole mission, I want to clarify rules on writing letters. On Sunday night, you may write your letter to me. That is the only day besides P day. This gives you a small head start on your preparation day and a great way to account for your week in your letter. No other letters to me or anyone else should be written at any other time, even in your notes. Mm -hmm. Period. Control. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) What? Um, This was something that was read and shared several times on my mission, and I don't know if you want me to read this, but... It's called the Fellowship of the Unashamed, and it's kind of like a statement of commitment, like a motto, and or like a pledge of allegiance. And this is what brainwashing sounds like. Okay. Do you want to hear it? Sure. Great. I was hoping you'd say that. (laughs) It says, "Do you want to read it?" If you want me to. I yeah. I want. I think that you'll enjoy it more if you read it. Okay. I am part of the fellowship of the unashamed. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I won't look back, let up, slow down, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with the low living, small planning, smooth knees. (laughs) I told you. Colorless dreams, tainted visions, Worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I now live by faith, lean on his presence, walk with patience. I am uplifted by prayer and labor with power. My face is fixed, my gait is fast, and my goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few. Oh, I hate this. My guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I could not be bought compromised, detoured, lured away, divided, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder in the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. Ugh, who wrote this? I don't know. (laughs) I won't give up, shut up, or let up until I've stayed up, stored up, paid up for the cause of Christ. I must go till he comes. Give till I drop. Ugh. Come on. Preach with all I know and work until he comes and stops me. 
when he returns for his own. He will have no problem recognizing my banner will be clear. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for reading that. I You're just, welcome. I feel like it really, it was given the pizzazz it needed, Jeez. the commitment, the sarcasm. Yeah. Yeah. That's awful. <laughs> for so many reasons. I mean, the writing yeah. itself. Sure. I'm not going to listen to anyone else. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go and do. My mind cannot be changed. <laughs> My banner is clear. Steel trap. Under the banner of heaven. Mm-hmm. Okay. I obey heaven's laws first. All right. Okay. Yeah. Well, I read that several times on my mission with like fervor and devotion yeah. and aspiration. Disgusting. Oh, this is the last transfer, I believe. Okay. October 20th to November 5th. Dear sister, I think we talked a little bit about this before and how to stay strong during these last few weeks of your mission. Don't be getting trunky. No, remember? we've been over this. Remember your vocabulary? Don't be trunky. And I'm going to say it again. That is going to begin with being committed to setting and achieving inspired goals and plans. When you are committed to them and to the Lord in the process, he will find a sense of accomplishment that cannot be received in any other way. I think he meant you will find a sense. It's what will keep you focused, especially if you have a goal for studying and for enhancing a Christ-like attribute. I know that you're working hard, but make the very best of the last few weeks and set some goals that will really stretch you to the finish line. Go big before you go home. With love, President. Huh. Just give it one more push and maybe get us a freaking baptism Something. before you go. That'd be great. Be great. That'd be great. You really haven't been pulling your weight. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And then in this booklet, there's this missionary poem that's called Missionary Goodbye. Oh, boy. And we don't need to read that if you don't long. want to. It, it's not really, but... You can sure if you want to. It's really cheesy. I don't doubt it. Um, at the very end of my mission, they put us, all the missionaries that were going home that transfer, we were all together in the mission home where the mission president and his wife live for that time. And they were <laughs> so giving us advice and stuff. So it's like the mayor has goes to the yes. designated house for the, yeah. their term. Yep. Wow. And um, you get kind of like a debriefing, I guess. And he gave us dating advice. Oh, great. Yeah. Sure. President's rules for dating, like never share a blanket. Always keep the lights on. Always keep your feet on the floor. No back scratches. <laughs> what? what yeah. You? Yeah. Jesus says no back scratches. Yeah. He Very important. was, if I remember correctly, he was a bishop for a young single adult ward. And so I think he was really used to giving young people dating advice like that, like mm-hmm. church dating advice. Mm-hmm. Okay. You don't want to get into trouble. Now, I, don't, I don't want you to, in my office. Go home straight away and get married, but don't touch anyone. <laughs> they read this poem to us called Missionary Goodbye. Goodbye, and we'll miss you, are words that are true. These are words that make us all bluer and then blue. Bluer than blue. And then blue? Yeah, that's what it says. Must be a typo. We've grown so attached to your handshake and hug. When we think of you gone, our hearts feel a tug. It doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. You pack up your stuff and you're gone overnight. You've been awkward and bold as you've opened your mouth while proclaiming the gospel to those here in the South. You were green, you were pumped, showed on your face. Your goal was converting the whole human race. You sang, called to serve with real gusto and vigor, spent time on your knees till tender mercies got bigger. You okay. studied. <laughs> now listen. You A studied. less naive mind. <laughs> Can have fun with now, a few of the sentences in this poem so here. far. I mean, so, sometimes the lack of awareness. Yeah. On your knees. Open your mouth. It's just so... It's The great. tender mercy is going to get bigger. Oh, God. You studied Preach My Gospel, and you knew it by heart. You role-played and practiced. Come on. But you were eager to start. What? <laughs> uh. 
you've protected your iPads like they were your mother and treated your companions like your sister or brother. You've pedaled your bikes through the heat, bugs, and rain because loving tough things means you never complain. This is terrible. While serving in Jack's, you learned Southerners say, hey, y'all, and I'm fixing to have a blessed day. You've had aha moments that cause you to shiver. You've seen miracles, and you've cried a river. You ate grits and greens, boiled peanuts and taters, with key indicators, loved and taught all your gators. Not even once, sure made you better and stronger to guard and protect you forever and longer. Good God. What? <laughs> From your green arrival to your golden depart, you are a consecrated missionary with a dedicated heart. But time marches on, and before you blink twice, you're headed out there with lots of advice. Out there, things can happen, and they usually do. There'll be bumps in the road and new goals to pursue. So be sure when you step, step with great tact. And remember that life's a real balancing act. Yet, with no one to tell you to sleep or to wake, You'll stay up till midnight eating candy and cake. Uh, Where's your companion? Oh no, you're alone. You'll quake and you'll shake and let out a groan? (laughs) What? Oh, and then a companion's not around, finally. (laughs) But you'll be okay, so don't worry. Don't stew. There are many adventures that one person can do. Like backing out of your driveway with no back or upper and not having a scheduled appointment for supper. You can drive to a beach for the sun, surf, and sand or drive miles and miles just exploring the land. P-days, transfers, car and housing inspections, pros clothes and meetings, and those door slam rejections. There were rules that if heeded would keep you from dangers. Yes, safe and secure when you're talking with strangers. You obeyed with exactness in the face of fatigue. With the Lord on your side, you were bound to succeed. We're glad for the times that we've shared with you. We've watched as you grew and you grew and you grew. grew. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. Today is your day. Go now without hesitating. Your education and occupation are around the next bend. Eternal families, exaltation, and enduring to the end. With a tear on our cheeks and a smile ear to ear, we'll love you forever. That's abundantly clear. Return now with honor to your family, your friends. Now, is this the place where your journey ends? No, the end is just the beginning. It's true because the rest of the story is all up to you. God be with you till we meet again. The end. Wow. That's really great. You're telling me that nobody in that lovely poetry reading wasn't like, Grew it, grew it, and grew it. Did no sexual thoughts, right? Not for these missionaries. Now look at me. I have porn shoulders. Look at you. Oh my god! This Ugh. podcast. Don't look. Garbage. Don't look. Sin, full of sin. <laughs> Seriously though, like after all of that, now look at me. If anybody, if my mission president or any of my companions that are still believing mm-hmm. compared me now to me then, they'd be like. She's she's lost the light in her eyes, that's for sure. She's apostate. Her countenance has changed. It sure has. It's very sad. Well, any final thoughts? It wasn't as personally problematic to me. Sure. Coming from yeah. him. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, it just reinforces the whole the whole thing is way too rigid mm-hmm. and controlled and manipulative. It's all set up that way. It's all meant to be that. Just the whole premise that I have to send this weekly email mm-hmm. to someone I really don't know. Yep. Like I said, you can tell he was doing his best. Could have been a lot worse, but we were people in this system. And I hope he feels like, you know, he did a good job as a mission president. And mm-hmm. that he knows... I think he's a good person, but looking back on it, it's not something I needed. (laughs) Could have done without it. Didn't need it. But yeah, you're right. The expectations going into this could have been, could have gotten way more personal, could have gotten way more invasive, but for what it was, was pretty standard Yeah. for that relationship. Anything else our listeners need to know? 
they need to know that the next episode will be the conclusion of season four Whoa. of the show. Wow. Oh my God. And if all of that goes according to plan, then that means we accomplished two goals that we set for this season. That we produce every episode on video and that we have something out every other week. Wow. And so far, we've done that. Thank you. I'm really proud of us. And when I say we, I mean me. And when we say we, I mean him. Because it is a, <laughs> a lot of work to do that. He sets it up. Yeah. I just show up. But thank you for sharing all of the stuff that you've shared. Thank you. Over these several episodes. I think it says a lot. I think it paints a picture. Yeah. Yeah. I think it does. I think. I think it's clear. I think you're right. That this is full of shit. <laughs> and it's bad. And it's not good. It's not a good time. So I think this was great. We hope you enjoyed. And uh, the next episode should be... um Pretty darn cool. We have a special guest. Surprise. Telling what I think is a pretty interesting story. I'm excited. Join us next time. How do we sign off again? Like this. So, you, so you're like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm Brother Dan. And I'm Sister Lisa. And this has been Siblings Inside. Bye.